In order to keep bringing you guys tons of free content, we work with brand partners who you'll hear from in this episode, including an advertisement from Zopa Bank. We're launching 20s Fest, an immersive event that will help you take your next step in your 20s. Whether that's progressing your career, starting a business, getting your money stitch sorted, buying a house, prioritizing your well-being, or making new friends, this is the event to be at. Help us shape the event by pre-registering your details via the link below. Welcome back to the Talk 20s podcast. Guys, we know that hundreds of you are tuning into the podcast for the first time every single week. So hello, new listeners, and welcome. Thank you, Spotify, for the info on this. However, we also know that only about 20% of you are actually hitting that subscribe button, and that's rubbish because we have so much goodness that you're missing out on by just listening to one episode. So hit that subscribe button, and let's introduce today's guest. We're joined in the studio today by Alice Benham. I have been following Alice for years and it's safe to say she really knows her stuff when it comes to starting and launching successful businesses. She is a business and marketing strategist and founder of On Paper Stationery, creating the most beautiful stationery for business owners and creatives. In this episode, we chat about how to build and grow value-driven businesses and some quick actions you can take to grow your business today. Enjoy the episode. Hello, Alice. Thank you so much for coming up to Liverpool to record with us today. We're so excited to have you here. Thank you for having me. It's so nice to be on the other side of the podcast mic. <laughs> like, I'm not thinking about what we're going to talk about. I didn't have to organise anyone getting here. So it's a dream. Yeah, absolutely. And I, big fan of your podcast, big fan of, fan of your platform in general. I've been following Thank you for you. ages. Um, and I think what you do is is amazing. And more young people should should see what you do and should hear about it, which is why we wanted you on Talk 20's podcast. Um, one of the things I think is so important to talk about straight up at the beginning of the podcast is your route into being a business owner is unlike no other, I think, because you have <laughs> never really had a proper job, right? No, the only proper job I've had was as a Christmas elf, which I don't think is a proper job in itself. No. So, <laughs> no, yeah, never had a proper job, officially unemployable, really glad it's worked out. Yeah. Really. <laughs> so tell us a little bit how you ended up in that situation then, because that's not, not the norm for a lot of people. You didn't go to university, you went straight into the world of work. Um, in, ter in terms of being a business owner as well. Tell us a little bit more about your story. So I was at school, I actually quite liked school. Like, I don't think I'm what you'd necessarily, you know, judge to be a school dropout. Like I was, you know, got good grades. I was a bit of a teacher's pet. Like I was that kid at school that would tell the teacher that they'd forgotten to ask for homework. Like oh, that was no, me. Alice, yeah, no. I wasn't popular for many <laughs> reasons. Um, but yeah, I actually really enjoyed school, but it was when I was getting into my A-levels, I was just starting to get this kind of itch to go and get into the real world. And that's the only way I can really reflect on it was I think I'd had a bit of a taste of work by being a Christmas elf. Um, and that does kind of underplay it a bit. It was basically running this like Christmas grotto and it you know, wasn't just a shed in a shopping center. It was like forefather Christmases, live reindeer, thousands live of kids reindeer, every day. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of regret that ethically now looking back, but you know, it, yeah. it was a different time. Um, so yeah, I'd kind of experienced a bit of work. It was really challenging, really fun. And I was like, that's what I want to be doing. And I just started to look at school and realize well, I'm in one room learning something so that six months later I can repeat it in another room and then get a grade. Like this feels really odd. Like mm -hmm. I don't understand what this is doing. And I, I knew that I was never going to go to university I don't really know how, but I always just knew not my path. Mm -hmm. My oldest brother's a doctor. So he'd like really gone through the university path. My other brother got a master's. Like it was like a university heavy family. Yeah. But I just always knew it wasn't for me. So I think it was those kind of things paired together. I was like, well, I'm a bit bored of school. I don't want to go to uni. School seems to be all about getting into universities. Like why don't I just go and do something else? Mm -hmm. So it was actually the Christmas elf job. They offered me a role managing this big Christmas grotto thing. Uh, so I left school for that, left school to be an elf, oh uh, which was interesting. How old were you at this point? 16. Oh, wow. So I left school at 16, um, which in the UK isn't legal. So I had no. to be hired as an apprentice, um, apprentice, quote unquote, yeah. uh, so that it was legal for me to leave school. Did that for about nine months, but got bored again. And then I was at a hotel breakfast in Peterborough, of all places. Um, and I met a guy who I didn't fall in love with, but he offered me a job. And um, by the way, I said I didn't fall in love with because I feel like that's where it sounded like it was going. But <laughs> then it just sounded really weird that I felt the need to add that in. He was way older than me. I definitely didn't fall didn't in love fall with him. Didn't fall in love with him, yeah. Yeah, he was married. Anyway, yeah. now it sounds like I'm covering something up. I'm not. 
Alice, um, what's going on here? I know, right? <laughs> You've got the title of your episode already. <laughs> Alice tells all. Um, now, I bumped into this guy at a hotel breakfast and he ran a charity. Okay. Um, we got talking, told him I wanted to be in events. He offered me a freelance job in his events team. Uh, it turns out that job wasn't available, so I actually got given a social media job. I didn't know what freelance meant. So suddenly at age 17, uh, they said, right, you run your own business. Now you work for yourself. And I was like, okay, here we go. So Mm -hmm. massive accidental entrepreneur. But looking back, I can see those like tendencies in my younger self. Like I'd always had little side businesses and I always kind of liked going out and doing my own thing. So Mm -hmm. yeah, it doesn't surprise me now that this is where I've got to, but this was not the plan ever. Mm -hmm. So you went from that at 16 to going into freelancing. Where have you, where have you gone now? Because how many, how many years have you technically been working in the working world and running your own business? So I'm 25. So that would be eight, seven, eight years. Wow. Yeah. Probably in my eighth year now. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, it's evolved a lot since. So Mm -hmm. those early days I worked as a like social media strategist, freelance social media manager, um, made a lot of mistakes very early on, which I can talk about. But yeah, it's evolved a lot since then. So now my kind of main job title is business and marketing strategist. So I get the total pleasure of basically just spending all day chatting to amazing entrepreneurs about their businesses uh, and then do a lot of other bits alongside that. So host podcasts, host events, host retreats, have a stationary brand, Mm -hmm. do public speaking, bit of a Mm multi-hyphenate and or not very good at saying no, Mm -hmm. you pick. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let's talk a little bit because I think multi-hyphenate jobs are becoming the norm now. It literally is that you kind of, especially if you step anywhere near the freelancer entrepreneurial kind of world, you do have to kind of get good at everything. What's been your strategy for kind of getting good at all of those different things? Oh gosh, just get started. Like you only get good by doing stuff. I think we spend so much time sat around going, I'll start when I'm good at it. Mm -hmm. Or like, oh, I can see this person here. Gabby's really good at hosting a podcast. So when I'm that good, that's when I'm going to begin. And I think we forget like everything Gosh, if people listen to the first couple of episodes. Right? Yeah. Like (laughs) scroll back on my podcast, like 230 something episodes ago. Like it was awful. Mm -hmm. But like you don't get to be good unless you just start. Mm -hmm. And like the best way to get better is to do, especially in business, because there's no rule book there's no blueprint so you just have to get started and be really open to getting it wrong and learning a lot of lessons Mm -hmm. as you go well let's talk about some of those lessons then in the in the early days obviously you mentioned there that you had so many different mistakes and I think that's totally natural being Mm -hmm. a 17 18 year old trying to figure out what it is you're supposed to do in terms of the business world what were the mistakes you made that you kind of want our listeners to know about and be aware of if they're thinking about making that step Oh gosh, how long have we got? Where do we begin? Um, I'd probably say the three main mistakes that I made in the early days, first of all, was in terms of my energy and time. So the the thing that kind of brought everything to a head for me in my first year of business is I massively burnt out. Um, mm. I was overworking. I didn't have client boundaries. I didn't know how to say no. Um, I'd say I still struggle with all of those things, but you know, I hadn't learned the basic things of like, you know, you probably shouldn't be working seven days a week and your client doesn't need a reply right now just because they're paying you money. And so I was just completely overworked and as a result, really burned out. I think that was the first mistake. I think the second mistake I made was financial. So didn't split my business and personal finances, Mm -hmm. didn't price from a strategic place, didn't save money for tax. Yeah. That was a massive one. Mm -hmm. I didn't save money for tax. And then one day the HMRC brown envelope turned up, which we all dread. And Mm -hmm. it told me that I owed thousands of pounds that I didn't have. That was the whole situation. So there's a lot of financial mistakes. And then I think the other one was really, I was just isolated. I remember thinking I was the only 17 year old business owner, which Mm -hmm. looking back is so arrogant. Like Mm -hmm. there are thousands of young entrepreneurs out there. And actually because I was so isolated, I wasn't supported and I didn't have people around me to kind of you know, have those chats with, or, you know, it's like, you just want people that get it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, my first year of business was basically a, a fast track learning curve. Um, but I'm really gl- grateful to those early days because you, you don't learn those things until you start. No. And you don't learn those things in university either. Like I've met a lot of people who've done business at university or even entrepreneurship at university. And you just don't learn what it takes to be a business owner mm. in university. And I don't think those courses uh, that, in my opinion, they're not set up to actually help people. I mean, this is a big statement coming from me, but like I've never, I've never thought that those courses are particularly helpful in terms of mm. the real world. I mean, I can't say I've done one, but I just think that like they're really, 
it is all about doing in entrepreneurship. It is all about learning yeah. through your failures. It is all about the things that you've kind of already done, been there and done. Um, so yeah, I think it's so, so important. But if you're thinking about building a business, you always stress that it has to be a value driven one. You always mm -hmm. think that when you come from like a, a value driven place, you see it all throughout your content that that is so important for you. If you are trying to achieve growth in a way that is sustainable and aligns with your values, how can you build a business that looks like that? Well, I think the first thing is knowing what your values are and mm -hmm. what a value driven business means to you, because it's different for everyone. Yeah. Um, and it is a tricky one where you kind of learn what your values are by just as we said already, like taking action. Mm -hmm. You know, I realized in that my first year of business, what's, you know, one of my biggest values was running a business that was like, you know, working with people that were doing good work. But I only realized that that was one of my values by working with people that weren't doing good work. And mm -hmm. it felt really bad. And I was like, why does that feel so bad? Oh, because I've got a value in that area. Yeah. Um. So I think if you're already up and running, it's maybe reflecting on some of your past experiences, what's felt good, what hasn't, and kind of trying to name perhaps some of the things that are most important to you. Um, and then I think in business, it's just keeping it front and center. You're never going to be perfect. But I think when we run a business in a way that feels good to us, it's immediately, A, just so much more enjoyable for us. We mm -hmm. deserve businesses that feel good. Um, and B, I think we bring more to it and and we we put more work in and we're more consistent when it feels good. Um the sustainability part, I think I speak from a place of making that mistake quite often of not running a business in a sustainable way, I guess, in terms of my workload. But yeah, when I think about what it means to do those things, it's really just running your business in a way that that feels good and is good to other people. Mm -hmm. I hate the narrative of you've got to pick between being good and making money. Like those two things are not mutually exclusive. You can hold your values really tightly and you can be clear on your non-negotiables and you can also make a ton of money at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's not easy, but it's definitely doable. It definitely can be done, 100%. And I think the way you talk about kind of having like sustainable growth as well, I think that's really tricky because I think naturally in any kind of business, I've never met uh, an entrepreneur that has literally had this very clear trajectory mm. line that's just been, oh, so sustainable. Like there's definitely been periods of time where they've been working crazy hours. There's definitely been periods of time where the, you know, the the work that they've been doing has not been paying off. Um, and I think it's really hard to kind of find that balance all the time. I think I, especially as an entrepreneur, I'm always trying to find a balance. Um, and that can be really tricky with so many uncertainties going on because naturally when you launch any kind of business, it's not a consistent paycheck. That's literally what you signed yourself up to. Mm. Um, so what advice would you have on that kind of the ever-changing like narratives of business? Mm. Yeah, I think on that sustainability note, it's almost knowing, I guess, what your version of a sustainable workload looks like. Mm. And for me, it's sometimes not looking at like, is this sustainable right now? Like I would say I'm in a period right now where I'm working a ton of that. Like this is not sustainable. If I kept working the level I'm right now forever, yeah. I would burn out. Something would go wrong I drop the ball but sometimes for, for me at least sustainable business and sustainable growth is going okay I'm in a really busy season right now but I can see when and how this would end and I'm doing the things that I need to do to like keep myself okay mm -hmm. I think it's totally unrealistic like you said to you know promote the idea of like oh you can work four hours a day and and grow a successful business like maybe when you're years in mm -hmm. or you've made your exit and you've got your millions but like mm -hmm. businesses take graft it takes hard work and I think you've got to find for you almost what how much hard work you're willing to put in mm -hmm. um but yeah it's a tough one isn't it in terms and of also like finding the right team to grow around you as well because yeah. I think that's one of the tricky things like the more that you can delegate and we've been chatting about it over lunch as well the more that you can delegate and get good at delegating the more freedom you might find in your time whereas if you're trying to hold on to certain tasks and certain things that are you only you can do in the business mm. that's only going to limit your growth in, in, in my opinion but what, what's your view on that? Yeah, I mean, it's pivotal, isn't it? But it's also really hard. Mm -hmm. A lot of us run businesses because we like having control and we maybe don't like the dynamic of like being in teams and relying on other people or kind of being in that dynamic. You know, we want to be able to like swan off on holiday at a random yeah. day. Not that we ever do, <laughs> which is the funny thing. We're yeah. like, I want flexibility. And then we work 10 hours a day <laughs> from our spare bedrooms. Um, but yeah, I think it's really pivotal to growth. We have to learn to ask for help, you know, whether that's in, in team and outsourcing and delegating or whether it's just asking for help you know, emotionally getting support from the people around us or, 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 you know, asking for referrals from your network. It's like, it takes a village to mm -hmm. run and grow a business. 
the, the challenge though is, is never with others. It's always with us as the business owner. We've got to learn how to delegate and get support and not be superheroes, not think I should be able to do it all and I don't need help. Actually, I think there's a lot of humility in realizing that we can't do it all and mm-hmm. we're better when we kind of build networks and support systems and teams. But I am saying that as someone who, mm-hmm. yeah, I find that really difficult, just being honest, but it has to be done because when you run a business, if the buck stops with you, there's going to come a point where you can't grow it anymore Mm -hmm. because your capacity is limited. Yeah. And also your knowledge is probably limited as well, because let's face it, like we're two 20 somethings running businesses. We don't have all the skills in the world. We don't have all the prior experience, but we're we're learning on the job. And I'm sure Mm. lots of listeners who are tuning in are either in that position or hoping to be in that position one day, but you kind of have to have, like you say, that humility to be like, I don't know everything. I'm going to go out and learn that stuff. And I'm going to build a support network around me that can help and guide me to do this because I believe it's possible, but I, you definitely can't do it on your own. Yeah, you definitely can't. But that you also, I think, have to realize like no one's going to care about your business as much as you. Very true. And no one, I mean, unless you've got like a really supportive, like partner or friend or parent or whatever, for like most people will just think in the back of their heads, I'm not quite sure that thing that they're trying to do is going to work out. <laughs> like, <laughs> let's be honest, right? Like starting a business is crazy. Yeah. You're basically deciding that you're capable of doing something that you have no proof that you are actually capable of doing. When mm-hmm. you think about it like that, it's like, yeah, that I mean, is yeah. wild <laughs> that our brains decide that. We're yeah. like putting in this work in the hope that in six months it's going to pay off. So I think you also have to find like really strong internal, um, I think you've got to love it and mm-hmm. you've got to love the process and you've got to find that almost inner determination because mm-hmm. no one's going to care about it mm-hmm. as much as you do. Um, I've heard someone describe it as unshakable self-belief. Yeah. And I think that is the best describer uh, mm. of what you need. And if you don't have that unshakable self-belief, yeah. then you will really struggle because there will be really trying days. There'll be days that are set to test you when everything's gone wrong. This order's not arrived. Um, this inv- invoice payment hasn't landed. And, you know, you know, you've know, you got technical problems. Your laptop's just broke and it will test you. And you have to, in those days, kind of remind yourself why you started and believe that it's going to work out in the end, I guess. Yeah. I see it as naive optimism. Yeah. It's like the thing that you need to run a business. Yeah. And it's part of the reason I'm so glad I started a business so young mm-hmm. because I was insanely naive but insanely optimistic like I didn't know what was coming for me I didn't know what I was getting myself in for and I actually think that was a good thing because I just threw myself at it I just gave it a go I didn't really have any like fears or or worries about what would go wrong I was just like this is so cool I'm just gonna keep going and I think you do kind of have to have like you've got to be slightly crazy Mm -hmm. otherwise everyone would do it Just a quick one from our sponsor, Zopa Bank, home of the Smart Saver account. Zopa Smart Saver lets you save in different pots at different interest rates, depending on the notice period you choose to access your savings. The bigger the notice period on your pots, the bigger the interest rate. To find out more about the Zopa Smart Saver, download the Zopa app. We need to tell you that boosted interest pots are subject to a notice period, the longest of which is 95 days for the highest interest rate. You need to save a minimum of one pound and the interest is paid monthly and is subject to variation. Do you think if you knew what you know now about starting a business and how the journey has been that you would do it again? Oh gosh. I think I would, but mainly just because I don't know what else I'd do. I think I'd, I'd be miserable with someone trying to tell me what to do or, um, I, I I think maybe I'd try a different business. I'd love that. I'm not tied to the the physical business that I run. Mm -hmm. Um, I've always thought in years to come, I'll probably run a completely different business, but yeah, I think as soon as you've tasted that like level of autonomy and challenge and satisfaction, I just don't think anything else could match it. Mm-hmm. And also when you've spent seven years not knowing where your next salary is coming from, you kind of get over it. Mm-hmm. Like I, I, I've never known what it's like to have a regular source of income. So I guess I don't know what I'm missing out on. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the things I see you talk about a lot on your platform is uh, marginal gains and tiny actions over massive yeah. progress. Because I think when all of us set out to start a business, it's this great big dream that we have in front of us and it can feel so overwhelming to actually turn it into a reality. Like when we've got these great big goals ahead of us, for you then, how do you see that great big goal in front of you Mm. and make those steps towards it without feeling really overwhelmed? Be okay that you probably will feel a bit overwhelmed. I think it's the first thing Mm -hmm. that I would say. Like it's normal, I think, to feel a bit of overwhelm, a bit of fear, 
a bit of perfectionism, a bit of comparison, like all of those feelings are really normal. And I think the biggest mistake we make is expecting for those feelings to go away Mm -hmm. and going, right, when I don't feel scared, then I'll start that thing. Or when I feel ready, then I'll do it. And actually, I think success comes when you learn to take action despite all of those feelings. When you go, right, I'm scared, but I'm going to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. I'm expecting myself to get it perfect. I know I'm not, so I'm just going to get it wrong first time. Like you have to almost force yourself, I think, into just getting the ball rolling. And those the first steps are the hardest because they're the newest. Like I now find um, taking action in my business quite easy. Like I started my second business in six weeks, but that was only because I took four years to start my first business. Yeah. Like your first <laughs> steps on a new thing are going to be the hardest and almost expecting it to be hard, I think helps because then you're not so hard on yourself. Um, and in terms of kind of having that goal and breaking it down, I try to see it as like, right, the the purpose of a goal is to bridge the gap between your long-term vision and your daily action. So first step is knowing what your long-term vision is. And it doesn't have to be crystal clear. Like I'm not a fan of 25 page long business plans that dictate, you know, the profit margins you'll be making in Q3 of 2025. Like Mm -hmm. that's not helpful for most business owners. To get started, you just need a North Star, Mm -hmm. a mission, a purpose, something that you're trying to work towards, even if that then changes over time. And then when you think about goals, you want to ask the question of, right, how do I kind of set a a goalpost that's going to get me towards that? So if the business, if I use my second business as an example, I was like, right, I want to start a stationary brand. That's the vision. Okay, goal number one is we need to create an initial product range. Right now, let's break that goal down. I think one of the biggest mistakes people make is they set a goal and then close a notebook and six months later wonder why they haven't achieved it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, if that goal is not front and center, and if you don't break that goal into 10 minute tasks that you can chip away at every single day, it's unrealistic to expect that you're going to achieve them. Mm -hmm. What does your, I would really like to understand as someone who also runs a stationary business as well, how do you actually organize your day? So a typical day, Mm -hmm. uh, you work from home, right? Um, Yeah. And how would you actually map out your day productivity wise as well, because all of your business um, on paper is all about productivity and how we should plan our day and set ourselves up for success. So what is your go-to? How would you do it? Oh, great question. Every day is a bit different, but I'd say my like two or three days a week where I'm at home, like doing calls, doing my thing. A few things that really help me is first of all, having limits around when I do calls. Mm -hmm. So I work probably most days like around 8am to 6pm that might be long or short to some people, but like that's my general hours. But I don't do calls outside of 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Mm-hmm. if I can help it. Let's always be honest. There's always a little outlier when you've got to sneak something in. But by having my calls in that set time, I get two hours every single morning where I can just focus on my stuff. Sometimes that's like an urgent client thing that I need to reply to. Sometimes that's moving forward a project that I'm working on. That really helps me to kind of make those like marginal gains every single day Mm -hmm. and not be so distracted because a lot of my work is on calls with clients or recording podcasts. I can sometimes feel very busy, but I'm not actually moving stuff forwards, moving the needle, as people say. So that's something that really helps. And I think the other things that helps, first of all, just like having a to-do list. Mm -hmm. And that sounds so basic, doesn't it? But like, if you don't have a list, you're basically relying on natural motivation and your brain which as we all know, our brains like aren't always the most reliable Mm -hmm. things. So I write a to-do list the day before for the next morning. So it's the last thing I do when I leave my desk or I, you know, finish up my laptop, I'll be doing it on the train home this afternoon is I will just write my list for the next day. And what that means is then when I arrive at my kind of work day, I've already done the thinking. Yeah. I can, I I just try and take the energy out of it. And I just go, okay, what's the first thing that's going to happen? And I think environment as well. Like if you work from home, especially, you know, put on a different outfit to work, light a candle when you start work, try and create space that's just for work, take a break at lunch. It's the basic stuff. Everyone will have Mm -hmm. heard it before, but we think there's some magical answer to productivity. And actually it's the tiny habits that really make a difference. Mm -hmm. We've been using Notion to to run Talk 20s. It's we pretty much call it like the Talk 20s Bible. (laughs) Like literally everything is in there. Everyone can see it. It's really visible. And like, I have loved like being able to create like my to-do list on there. And for me, like I automate my to-do list so that when I click it and it will set me up a new to-do list, it will have some things that are already populated in there. Like my morning routine, always the same. Yeah. I try and journal for 10 minutes and I try to read something of a, of a book before every morning. And it will have some things in there that are just daily to-dos, but then it will also have loads of blanks in there in terms of what I need to fill in for my day. And I also try and do it the day before. Mm. Um, and I also, when I used to just write just a to-do list that was literally like 
a brain dump pretty much. Like here's all the things you need to do. Everyone will probably relate to this, but I used to just pick my favorite things. Yeah. And I used to do them first and they're usually the easiest things and they're usually not the things that move the needle forwards. Yeah. And then all the things I was putting off, I'd be like, ah, oh, I didn't get to it. Did, mm-hmm. did loads of other things on my to-do list. Look, I ticked off 10 things, but actually like none of the 10 things were actually very helpful. Yeah. So I started breaking down my to-do list into like first, later, and if I have time. And first I'd put things in there that were actually needed priority and I have to finish that block of to-dos mm-hmm. before I move on to the later to-dos I kind of see it as morning and afternoon most of the time before I move on to later and if I get to the so that if I have times great yeah. but if I don't I, I don't and they're the things that actually don't matter and can actually be moved on to another day and just kind of being really sensible about my to-do list because I will trick myself into thinking I've been super productive in a day mm-hmm. by ticking off 20 things but one of them might be shower and I'm like I'm sorry but like you know, everyone knows that you need to shower every day or, you know, something stupid like send an email to a friend because of X, Y, Z. And it's actually nothing to do with work, but I, yeah. you know, it needs to get done, but it's not actually making me feel any more productive mm. or moving my business forward at all. That's a fantastic tip. Yeah. Like numbering your to-do list, having mm-hmm. like three top priorities. Cause like we can't trust our brains. No. Our brains are like out for comfort. Yeah. Of course they're going to do the easy things. Of course they're going to put off that task. that's really going to make a difference mm-hmm. because it feels a bit risky. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think the more that you can kind of not rely on your brain, I know that sounds like really odd advice, yeah. but like you have to think our brains are built for comfort. Mm-hmm. Business growth it often doesn't come from comfort. Yeah. So a lot of the time you've got to almost like get outside your brain Mm -hmm. to grow. You recently turned 25 and you did a podcast um, on your um, podcast platform talking about the 25 things that you want, that you suggested people should do to to grow their business. Yeah. I listened to this and I thought this is, it was a fabulous episode. So everyone should go listen to it themselves. But there were five things in that list that I thought we should bring into this podcast episode that I'd love to chat about with you. Um, So five actions to grow your business today. One of the first ones I loved was to ask a friend or a person in your network for coffee to deepen the relationship. Mm. And I think there is so much power in doing this. Have you, have you done this one recently? Yeah, massively. Actually, this is a good reminder to me. I'm like, I'm going to do all these things again. But (laughs) yeah, I mean, as I said earlier, like being isolated, one of the biggest reasons that I burned out and and made a lot of mistakes early on in business. And Mm -hmm. I've really learned since, like, what's that phrase? It's a bit cringe. It's like your network is your net worth. Yeah. Like it's a bit of a, you know, wanky way of saying it, but like that is true Mm -hmm. in business. Like your network is invaluable. And I don't mean that in the sense of like, you know, build a network that's going to like make you money and like don't build like strategic network. Like Mm -hmm. I'm not really about that. But like if you build a network of people who are good people and who add value in the sense that they offer you support or inspiration, whatever it might be, like treasure those people. Like they are invaluable Mm -hmm. to your mental health and your success as a business. You know, and I look at a lot of the things that I'm able to do now, they all come from network. And I think we often put a big focus on making new relationships, but actually how much of a focus do we put on deepening the ones we've already got? So true. So like, yeah, go to a networking event, meet, meet some new people, but also like, who did you meet at a networking event a month ago that you could follow up with? Yeah. Who's that person that you're always chatting with on Instagram that you could just make the first move and like actually have a proper conversation? Um, I think we can get a bit scared of making the first move, but mm. you never know what's going to happen. This is your sign to ask a friend or person in your network to go for coffee. Do it. Do it. Um, the second one is, and it's very apt that we should talk about this one, is to pitch a news story to a journalist um, or to pitch to feature on a podcast. And today, Alice, where have you been featured? <laughs> Forbes. Whoa, that's amazing. <laughs> Honestly, congratulations, because I think every business owner one day dreams that they'll be in Forbes and this is you. Congratulations. Thank you. You made it, girl. <laughs> I know. I need to like take it in. I'm. Uh, we're all so rubbish at celebrating our wins, aren't we? Or at least I feel like most of us We are, were saying, so. me and George were saying to you, you need to print it off, put it in a frame, <laughs> stick it on your wall because it's a huge achievement. Um, but tell us a little bit more about, you know, what people can do to pitch in because was that, tell us a little bit about the story of how did you manage to get in there mm. for a start? I mean, that one kind of links the last one actually because that came from a place of my network. So mm-hmm. I actually knew the journalist who was writing for Forbes, brilliant, brilliant Bianca. Um, and yes, yeah, she, because already knew of me, I think she writes a regular column for Forbes and just thought, hey, Alice would be a good fit. And actually that kind of opportunity came to me, which is like crazy wow. to say, yeah. like really, really grateful for that. Um, but yeah, I've had a lot of other pieces, like I was in the Times, I was in Business Insider, can't remember any of the others, but probably a few others that have all come from putting my name forwards. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually that's something I'm not very 
good at. Like I find, again, comfort zone. I'd rather just sit back and wait for Forbes to come to me. Like yeah. I don't want to come after it. <laughs> you know, fear of rejection, can't be bothered to put in the work, whatever reason it might be. But actually these brands, publications, you know, whether it's Forbes or someone's podcast or an event that you want to speak at, like why not throw your hat in the ring? Mm -hmm. Often these organizers or hosts or journalists, like they're looking for people to platform. Literally their job mm -hmm. as a journalist is to find people to write about. Or, you know, my job when I'm running my podcast is to find business owners that are going to be a good fit. And actually they're looking for people to put, put their name in the ring. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a really good habit to build and a good kind of skill to to strengthen is pitching and putting yourself forward for things. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I try and do it every single day in my business. I try and do one piece of outreach, whether that's, you know, just saying hi to someone new on LinkedIn, whether that's pitching to be on uh, someone's podcast, whether that's applying to, for an award. I hate it. It feels really icky. I don't really enjoy it, but it's an invaluable habit mm -hmm. because, you know, as much as I don't like it, like a lot of those things do really help your business and they're quite cool as well they yeah make you feel quite good I, I think you're so right there and I think what I've been trying to do because I'm trying to follow in your footsteps um is to try and, and and build any anything you hate doing about your business but you know is absolutely crucial to grow it is to set yourself up a little habit tracker mm. to really say like you know I need to you know if it's one outreach a day to a, a platform and you know it doesn't matter if you if they ghost you, if they don't reply or they come back and say it's not right, whatever, the point is you put yourself out there and you gave it a go. Yeah. And to just be able to like habit track every time that you do that, it kind of really keeps you in check. Mm -hmm. Because for me, if I, if it was, it would be one of those things on my to-do list that would, I'd get to the end of the day and be like, oh, I didn't have time for that. But when you actually make it like a habit that you're trying to trying to keep, I feel like it, it, it grows so much more from there. So much so you then kind of build it into your day and it becomes natural to you and second nature. And you're like, why did I ever find that hard? I, I've done it over and over. It's just, I think by repetition, you eventually, it bec you come, become a bit more like numb to the kind of rejection or whatever bad thing might come of it if you if you think that might come around. So. Yeah, massively. It's like we were saying earlier, that like messy action, the marginal gains, like just try and build the habit of taking the action. Mm -hmm. You know, don't worry too much about the result and you never know what will come from it. You never know. The, the third one of our five actions to grow your business is to tell people online what you do and invite them to buy. Now, this sounds like the most simplest thing <laughs> to literally tell people online what you do, but I'm guilty of it. I don't tell people enough what we do, why we do it and invite people to sign up to the main list to listen to a podcast. I just kind of assume that, you know, people know the next episode is out or assume that, you know, they're already signed up to their main list or, you know, they haven't. By the way, if you're listening to this podcast episode and you're not signed up to the Talk 20s to Me <laughs> newsletter, you need to be. Telling people what we do and inviting them to actually go and do it. Why don't we do it enough, do you think? Oh, I think so many reasons. I think it feels a bit scary, feels a bit icky. Mm -hmm. We know what we do, so we think everyone else does as well. There's a lot of assumptions there. Uh, it's actually a thing called knowledge bias is where we think, oh, I know it, so everyone else does. Like, mm -hmm. I know that I've got this mailing list that's great. So obviously, you know as well. Or we forget that repetition is important. So we think, well, I talked about it six months ago in that one Instagram post. And we forget maybe that people have forgotten about that mm -hmm. or that, you know, some people have followed us since. Um, and the analogy I always use to make us realize like how illogical it is when we don't sell is that if you don't tell people what you do and invite them to take action, whether that's signing up to a mailing list or buying your product or buying a ticket to your event, whatever it might be, it's a little bit like you're opening a restaurant, but there's no menus and there's no waiters. So it's like you're just getting people to sit down and if they really, really want the food, they have to, you know, find their way to the restaurant, kitchen, look at what the chefs are making, figure out what they could have and then like beg the chef to make it for them. <laughs> like, that's so odd, right? You would, that's true, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You wouldn't be surprised if that restaurant then failed, but we do the exact same in our businesses. Mm. We're like, why is no one buying my product? And it's like, well, when was the last time you showed someone what your product was and told them why they might want to buy it? Oh, Yeah. Or like, oh, why is no one inquiring about my freelance services? When was the last time you told them how to inquire and what the, the next step is if they're interested? Like we just can't make assumptions, but I think we do it all the time in business. We think they know what I do. They're bored of hearing it. They know what the next step is. But actually we all need a bit of a nudge sometimes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that's something all of us could probably do a bit more of is just advocating a bit more for what we mm -hmm. do. And as you found today, right? You yeah. talked about your newsletter 
And some people signed up to it. There's yeah. there's people ready Lots and waiting. Lots of people signed up to it. And I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> there's actually loads of people who weren't signed up who didn't know. And I'm like, well, I should post about this way more often. Yeah. Um, but then I think that the one side of things that I always think about is I'm so nervous that I don't want every single thing that I post on online to then be like an ad for this and an ad for that. Like mm. how much is like too much repetition in, in your kind of um, world? Because I do kind of think that like there is no end to it because ultimately your content is being seen amongst so many other people's content. They might be following their friend from home. They might be following an influencer from that they've been following for ages. Like it's not actually like your content isn't the only thing they're consuming. So mm. I wouldn't be too worried, but I, I kind of think about it like that. But then I also think like, oh God, I don't want to turn people off by keep talking about what it is that mm. we do. What's your view on that? Think about it a bit like a magazine. Like magazines are so brilliant at partnering like engagement led content with action led content but you don't notice it and that's how they do it so well like you read an article that's you know maybe an interview with Marie Claire or someone that you might be mm -hmm. interested in I'm just thinking the magazines my mum reads hence mm -hmm. why Marie Claire was the first example there um and then next to that you've maybe got a list of like the five lipsticks that you want to buy and what you don't realize in a magazine is like all five of those lipsticks are like affiliate and sponsored or whatever. Mm -hmm. And there's money being made there. Or there'll be like an integrated ad next to the piece that's, you know, giving a piece of value. And I think we want to look at our content in the same way. Like when you're putting stuff out that's educational or inspirational or, you know, relatable, anything that's giving value to people, that is buying their attention mm -hmm. for then when you invite them to take action. And I say invite them to take action because I think we often think, oh, if I'm selling, that's aggressive, that's pushy. And of course we don't want to be doing that. We don't want to be doing that at all, let alone all the time. So I think it's just looking at like, where are kind of those gentle nudges that you can give people? Mm -hmm. And actually when it's done well, it, it's not the whole piece of content. You know, if I'm wanting to promote my one-to-one -one services, I'm not often going to put out a post that's just like, if you want, I've got three slots. If you want to work with me, here's how. Yeah. I might put out a piece of content that's like, come with me on a client strategy day. Here's what we did. Here's why I do this work. Oh, and if you're interested, blah, blah, blah. Or sometimes yeah. I won't even say that bit. It's just that telling them that that's something I offer reminds them. Yeah. So for me, it's like the subtle sell. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I rarely come across people that do it too much. Mm -hmm. I think if you're worrying about doing it too much, that tells me you're never probably going to be doing it too much and you could yeah. probably be doing it more. <laughs> okay. Subtle selling is the way forward. And I, I've, I've said yeah. to you earlier, I think you are the queen of subtle selling. Just like, Thank you. you know, your content is great and we we know, you know, I love watching your stories and we know so much about you, but there's always just a very nice thread throughout that never feels like you're really being sold to, but makes me really excited to, you know, join one of your group coaching courses or work with you one-to-one. -one. And I think mm. that's that we all need to learn those lessons and you are one of the best people to to oh, model that so thank kind. you Alice um number four is to and I I think this is a brilliant one to create an email template that you're always writing from scratch how many times do I write an email to invite someone to come onto the podcast how often do I write an email to speak to a brand about a brand partnership or to uh, tell you your the itinerary for coming up today that can be a template. Yeah, It can be a template and it could save me a lot of time. Yeah, I'm all for looking for the, the pockets of efficiency mm -hmm. we can bring into our day. You know, we've already talked about it, running a business or, or doing anything. Like life is full on and time is your most limited resource. And I think we've always got to be looking at, right, how do I get just a bit more time back? And I think sometimes we get a bit dramatic with it. Like, oh, I need to hire a whole employee mm -hmm. to take stuff off my plate. And I'm like, yeah, that could be the solution. But like, what about just getting 20 minutes back every day? Because that's going to add up. 20 mm. minutes every single day, think about what you could do in that time. And maybe you do more work in that time or maybe you just like don't work in that time. Like, hello, finishing earlier, that sounds nice. Mm. Um, so yeah, for me, again, it's like the marginal gains, but when it comes to streamlining your workload. So just look at the things that you do repetitively and question if there's a way that it could be better. Mm -hmm. So even we were talking before about, um, I was chatting to Georgia about it, of like if you're always finding yourself scrolling through your um, camera roll, to like mm. find different videos and clips. Okay, if I'm doing that like on a weekly basis for content, okay, maybe I can make an organized content library that will take me a bit of time, but then it's going to make that task 10 times quicker every time yeah. I go and do it. Or like you said, with the email, right? If I'm writing the same email every day and every time I'm maybe looking for the one I sent before just to copy and paste it a bit. Yeah. Cool. 
let's make a template, make it easier. Since I listened to your podcast, we have now created a tab in Notion where we literally have different email templates for different occasions. And oh, already, so I would probably say, say it's probably saved me about at least half an hour. And that was only like a week ago that I made. So um, I really do think our listeners will benefit as well. The last one that I think is probably the most uncomfortable to do actually mm. is to ask someone for feedback to find your blind spots. Mm. Now, this one is a tricky one because quite often like, as a business owner, it's your baby, right? So it can feel so personal yeah. receiving feedback that is, you know, in any way, not even negative, but sometimes even neutral. You can be like, oh my gosh, you don't love it. Like, and it's yeah. my baby. Like, do you know what I mean? And I think that can feel really difficult, but it is so powerful to get feedback because how mm. are you supposed to make changes or adapt without that knowledge? Yeah. Um, what's your advice for reaching out for feedback? Oh, I think you've got to get over yourself a little bit, haven't you? you? Mm-hmm. Which, you know, I'm I'm putting my hand up with everyone else as well. It's hard. You know, when when we think about asking for feedback, it makes me laugh. What we often just jump to is like, what we're asking for is a, a testimonial. And like, mm-hmm. that's two different things. Yeah. Someone saying like, yeah, working with Gabby was amazing because she's so this and her work is so that. Like, that's lovely. That's a testimonial. Mm-hmm. That's not feedback. Like a feedback loop is that you're hearing about people's experiences and you're hearing the positive, you're hearing the challenges, you're hearing the constructive, you're hearing the ideas. And, you know, it's not easy. None of us enjoy reading things about ourselves and our businesses that are constructive. Mm -hmm. But so often those are the things that make a great business. And being open to feedback, I think, is a really undervalued skill. Mm -hmm. Because if you create a feedback loop, you know, the more that you take on the feedback, the better your business is going to get. And we know that, yeah, marketing and branding is great. But at the end of the day, if the core of your business isn't solid, if you're not great at what you do, if you don't give a great client or customer experience, you're not going to stick around for long. Mm -hmm. Like great brand and marketing can get people in the door. But if when they get in the door, it's an awful time, like you you failed. Mm -hmm. Or you're just going to have to get a lot better at getting more people in the door. And like, that's not fun, is Mm -hmm. it? Um, so yeah, something I really value when I do a lot of work with, with clients is like, how do we create that feedback loop? And what are the questions that we ask? So like, don't just ask about what did you love about this thing, but also like, how was your experience onboarding or mm-hmm. what was that part of the process like? Or could I have done anything to communicate this better? Um, and a lot of the time people do just still only say positive stuff and that's great, mm-hmm. but it's, it's worth it for the, the one in 10 where they go, have you ever thought about doing this? I would have liked that. And you go, oh, no, I hadn't thought about that. Mm -hmm. Like some of the best things that I do now with my clients are from ideas that past clients gave me of like, oh, it'd be really helpful if we were to have like session recordings afterwards. I was like, oh, that's really easy. I can do that. Yeah. And our clients love it. Mm -hmm. It's the same with on paper. Brutal. I get so much feedback. People tell me loads of things they don't like about the products. And I have to remember it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. I do have a little bit of a moan before I take the feedback on. Yeah. (laughs) Mainly human, but... um, (laughs) Yeah, I think asking for feedback. And if you feel scared about it, ask for feedback from people that you trust. Yeah. Ask family or friends, but give them a permission slip to actually be honest. Mm -hmm. Because the the nice stuff's nice, but it doesn't actually help you, Mm -hmm. does it? Yeah, no, it doesn't. And I and I think that that's such valuable advice. I'd love to chat to you a little bit more about your 20s in general. And yeah. we giggled a little bit earlier when we were talking about our biggest adulting failures because I told you mine. Um, but do you have anything that you kind of could share with our audiences that was a big, you know, mess up that you had, like a, a huge thing that went wrong that you, you'd you be happy to share with us um, that you maybe learned a, a huge lesson from? This is it's quite a personal one, but I couldn't think of any. Like I've made so many business mistakes. They're all like quite boring at this point. And I don't think I've ever talked about this what on a exciting. podcast. So. <laughs> Exclusive. Um, so I think it was genuinely like a few weeks after my 20th birthday. So I really like entered my 20s with this action. Um, I had a boyfriend who is, who's now an ex-boyfriend. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were in Texas together. Uh, I, th- I don't think I'd had any alcohol, which makes the story even worse. Uh, we'd been very like turbulent relationship, like never really on or off, but we're just mm-hmm. stupid. Um, and obviously when a relationship's kind of on rocky ground, what do you do? You go to a tattoo parlor and you go, we should get tattoos. Yeah, that would be a no. really good idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. So 20 years old, high on red lobster, probably. Not actually high, <laughs> just metaphorically. It's a brilliant red lobster. Um, and we went and got tattoos. And they separated us off. So I didn't even know that he was actually following through. He did. So I got his name. No. Yeah. 
For real? Yeah. So Still I, have it, Alice. Yeah. Oh my so God. So age 20, I got my boyfriend's name on my wrist. He got the date that we met on his wrist, uh, which is kind of awkward because I had a boyfriend at that. I didn't know. It was quite a date a while ago. So I didn't quite know what that was about. Um, so yeah, and then we must have broken up about two months later. Oh my God. Uh, and I had his name on my wrist and I still have his name on my wrist. Can I, can I say yeah. it? I'll show you. <laughs> oh, it's underneath because, your watch. Yeah, yeah, that's why I wear a watch <laughs> I was like, I really want evidence of this. <laughs> um, it's still on here because I paid £500 to get it lasered off and it didn't go anywhere. Oh my God. So instead, I've added to it. So it says okay. something different. Okay. Um, I'll show you like this. So his name was Cray because he was American. Okay. So it's C-R-E. Oh. And then it wouldn't go. So I just added ATE to the bottom. So, so now it says, it says create. Create. But, I mean, it looks trash. It's awful. But you, what a recovery. Because if I did that, Ooh. like, obviously I'm still with my fiance. <laughs> but if I did that Dan, like, I'm not sure what goes after Dan. Yeah, so, you can't like, recover from that. I can't recover from that. So no. lucky that he had a name that you could add ATE to the end exactly. and, still, and still make a really positive word like creates. But oh I my have, God, I think that's my favorite story of biggest adulting failures ever. I mean, it was I love that one, Alice. Quite the fail. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was, even when it was getting done, I was workshopping what I'd replace it with. So like, oh, really? I really wasn't thinking straight. And I remember getting home to my parents and being like, look, how funny is this? And they were just like, she leaves school at 16. Then she gets a tattoo of it. Like, I was just like ticking off all the things your parents don't want you to do. Um, but yeah, thankfully, my current boyfriend doesn't really care about it and it's never going anywhere, obviously. So. Yeah. Yep. Oh, well, thank you so much for sharing that story, Alice. And on that note, it's been amazing to have you on the podcast. I have absolutely loved chatting to you about how to grow a business in your 20s. But we ask all our guests the same question every single time on the podcast. And that is, what one piece of advice would you give to your 20-year-old self? If you could look at the ghost of Alice, who was 20, mm. who was just about to get that tattoo, apart from don't get the tattoo, <laughs> what, would you, what would you say to her? Oh, ask for help and be honest with other people. You're not a superhero. Mm -hmm. It's not impressive doing everything. You can do anything, but you can't do everything. So find community, ask for help, be honest when you're struggling, mm -hmm. learn to be vulnerable. Um, and yeah, just keep going. Because it's like genuinely when I think of my 20 year old self, I get emotional because I just think she'd have never thought that I'd be here now five years on. So I wouldn't change a thing. I'd just say, you know, ask for a bit of help because you oh. need it. <laughs> That makes, honestly, for me, that makes me feel warm and fuzzy inside. I'm sure that does the listeners. Thank you, Alice. It's been amazing to chat to you today. Thanks for having me. I've loved it. Woo!